have gotten asked, do you beep when you go through airport security? No. Yeah. No. <laughs> no, I don't. When, when you think about it, if, if you've had a hip replacement, you've probably got about a thousand times more metal in that hip replacement, if not more than you've got in the coils. If you've ever had like an appendicectomy or bowel resection or a gallbladder or even a, um, a sterilization, you've probably got metal clips inside you. And there's more metal in a couple of clips than there are in these tiny, tiny coils because they're so fine and thin. They're long, but they're very, very fine. So, and they're also, of course, made of um, platinum, which is inert. So, you know, compared to a lot of people are walking around with a lot more metal in them and aren't worried. And then they worry about these tiny bits we've got in them. It's yeah. Funny how the perceptions are. Okay, so that actually is a great segue into this next thing, which is yep. myths about pelvic congestion and treating pelvic congestion. So you talked about the coils, what they're made out of, and I did get some questions on Instagram. So I'm gonna pull those up here on my notes. And um, one of the things that I saw was very common in the Facebook support groups um, which, by the way, for anyone who's watching, I'm telling you right now, don't join the pelvic congestion syndrome Facebook support groups. Like, just don't do it. Um, find, use, you know, read Dr. Whiteley's research, read the published papers, read his book, read my blog. Like, those things are full of a lot more hope and a lot, like, if you're just going off the Facebook support groups, you're thinking that this is like a, a death sentence or like a lifetime of suffering, and it's totally not. So, but one of the things that I saw in the support groups and um, read about in some of the research was that people say that coils are dangerous because of the material they're made out of. So a lot of women in the Facebook support groups had really bad reactions whenever they got coils that were made out of nickel or other metals. And then of course, you know, there's a, a lot of awareness about heavy metals in the body and like what that can do, the types of inflammation that, or immune responses that that can cause. Um, so could you talk a little bit more about um, the materials the coils are made of, whether they're safe or dangerous, um, women who have potentially had nickel coils put in and they've had a reaction to them can you just talk all about what the coils are made of and if they're safe or not? Yeah, I, I mean, I can only talk about the ones that we've used. And we're, of course, an, as, as a center of excellence, we're very cautious as to whose we use. And um, we used to use Boston Scientific. We're currently using Cook. And these are big companies, well recognized. And the coils, one of the reasons they're expensive, they're made of platinum. And there is in the there can be a trace of nickel, um, you know, in the manufacturing accordingly. But it's such a trace. We in our group have never seen anyone with a proven problem with these. We ask about nickel allergy, and we've never seen that as a problem. You can get some irritation from the cause just because they're near sensitive organs, and that's why we use actually as a combination of foam sclerotherapy near the sensitive organs, and then coils further back. And it's a little technique, you know, we've perfected from that. And I've actually just um, I'm working with a company. I'm actually making a new device actually i've just got a new device that might replace coils but we can talk about that later but at the, the, at the moment if you're using reputable coils from a reputable company there really should be no problem now what i can't tell you of course is i can't tell you what's been either done in the past or i can't tell you about other companies that might supply coils in the world especially if they're doing them cut price or you know there is all sorts of things that happen as we know commercially Potentially, if you had one that had high nickel content and you're a nickel sensitive, potentially you could have a problem. But I think it's quite, certainly from our point of view, we've never come across it because we're very, very cautious as to which con uh, companies we use and we check them. I would just make, say to any patient, you know, who's worried about that, make absolutely sure that you know what your doctor's using. And also you can, um, uh, uh, certainly in the UK with Freedom of Information, we're always happy to give the code numbers of the coils we've used for the patient so the patient knows. Coils do come in different sorts as well. The, the ones we use at the moment have a little ho hole on the top of them. So what happens is if it's not in exactly the right place, you can pull them back out and put them in somewhere else. So the old coils, you just what to call push them out. And if they're in the wrong place, then you had to put a snare in and it's more complex. These ones you can reposition. Also, you get different sorts of coils. You get ones with little fibers woven into them, little what's called PTFE fibers. It's another thing that you, it's hypoallergenic. You can't get allergic to it, but it irritates the vein. It's much better to have these fibered coils. 
the smooth cores are more likely to be able to fly off. They're obviously cheaper. So if we were doing a patient with a very long vein, we might put a fibred coil at one end, then some smooth ones in the middle and a fibre on the other end to sandwich it in there. Um, but that would be the only time you'd use those. So really, I mean, if you're going to a reputable place now and you're, um, you know, you're seeing true experts, you should never have a problem with a, a nickel allergy or any substandard things. You know, it's, it, I, can't, I can't speak for every country and every supplier, but, but certainly, you know, anybody reputable using, using properly uh, CE marked or FDA approved coils, you, know, you shouldn't have that problem. Okay, wonderful. Thank you for clearing that up. Thank you for clarifying about the material of the coils. Another piece of misinformation that I think has been circulated is that coils are dangerous because they can perforate organs. Um, and people in Facebook groups have cited that they have either had an ovary or a kidney uh, perforated that was damaged or had to be removed because their coils perforated the organs. Can you speak to that at all? Um, again, if you're using reputable coils and you've also got a doctor who knows what they're doing, that's virtually impossible. Um, the way these things are put in is you've got a guide wire with a very, very, so you usually use the transjugular route across the neck. You use ultrasound to get in there. You've got wires that are made with a very floppy end, so they can't perforate anything. Um, they, they, they go down the inside of the vein. Um, you get into the right place, you put a little tube over the outside of it so you can inject contrast on the venogram so you can see exactly where you are. Um, you pull the inner bit out and the tube's in the right place. You put the coil down inside that. You start pushing the coil out using what's called a roadmap because you've, you've saved what the, look, the venogram looked like. And you keep checking the whole time. And these things are incredibly soft. They coil up inside the vein um, and they irritate the vein wall. Um, to, to, to perforate outside the vein even, um, it, it's different if you're stenting and ballooning where you have to be rough for the vein, but with the coil, I, I, you'd have to be hard pressed to perforate. Now, I suppose it's possible that if you have a, uh, an interventional radiologist or a surgeon who um, is a bit rougher, it's more likely that they are going to cause a perforation at the time of putting it in. It's unlikely to be the coil that causes it. It's more likely that they're using maybe a, a stiff guide wire or something, and it might be that they blame the coil later. Um, the, the, in the past, there's been certain situations where things like um, certain devices inside the body can erode through structures, and that's known about in bowel surgery and hernia surgery, but it's never been, to my knowledge, it's never been found when somebody's inside the vein, because the vein actually dies around it, and actually um, you get protein, put the, the vein becomes a protein wall scar tissue. I, I would be very interested in seeing the medical records of anyone who has had these things happen to them. And I think if you investigate them, unless this is like 30 years ago, 40 years ago, when they would, you know, first putting, or a doctor tried to use a coil that shouldn't have been used there, I think you'll find it was much more of a technical problem with the person putting it in rather than any of the actual coils. I, I, I think it's incredibly unlikely, unless there's some very strange anatomy or somebody's got something very wrong with them or, you know, it, it doesn't really track. Because when you, if you, if I could actually give you a coil now, and also the guide wire now, you would think, you know, you can't go through blancmange with it. I mean, it goes down the middle. and It really is. It really is the most gentle, gentle stuff. And to actually go out there to perforate an ovary or something, I mean, God knows how you could do that. I, I, I really think that's a, uh, if you're using the right equipment and the right techniques, I can't see how that can happen. So if, if someone watches this video and they believe that they have had a coil perforate an organ or something like that, you would want them to contact you and tell you so you could look at it? <laughs> Absolutely, please. I, I mean, all these things, we publish an awful lot. And um, I'm, we, we publish the one or two problems we had early days, of course, when we were learning how to do it. Um, we we publish all of our, our problems, you know, which luckily are very, very few. And it's very important for the medical community to know if there's a problem. And the worst thing that can happen in the medical community is that a patient gets a problem and then it's not shouted about, it's not published because then no other doctors know about it. What usually happens is, um, 
when you investigate these things, it's either someone hasn't had the problem, it's something completely different, or someone somewhere along the line is trying to hide what actually happened and they get told it's something, you know, so all of these things need to be looked at because we need to know as doctors, you know, who's doing a good job, who's not doing a good job. We need to know, um, you know, if a piece of equipment is wrong or the, the way we're using it's wrong and everyone needs to know. It's just that having done this for 20 years and, you know, <laughs> thousands of people in our hands, we've never seen anything like this. So I'd be fascinated to know how anybody could have a problem like that. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the things we also, we have this thing called the College of Phlebology Venus Registry so that every case we do goes onto a registry. And if there's ever a problem, the, 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 the idea with the registry nowadays, there's so this thing called the College of Phlebology Venus Registry. And what happens is we we put in our information but then the patients every year put in their information did you have a problem did you have so it's, it's, a, it's a combined doctor input but patient follow-up and patients are, put all their own equipment in so we anyone who's actually seeing a doctor who's part of the college of quality venus registry will always um, be, any problem will be followed up because that's exactly why we've got it there yeah that's amazing that's a great accountability process and follow mm follow through process you know following people for years and years and years because i'm going to have these coils in for the rest of my life <laughs> yeah absolutely <laughs> okay so another i don't know if this is true or not somebody asked me if this was was possible is that coils can hurt with when temperatures fluctuate so there have been anecdotal comments that people can feel pain from the metal being cold in their body during winter? Um, well, that would be amazing if that happened. So you've got a core temperature of 37 degrees centigrade. How would, how would the metal suddenly get cold? The only way you could do that, that I could think of is put, a, put, a, put some sort of wire down into it to touch the coil to freeze it. I mean, that, it doesn't make sense, does it? No. It's because, no, it, I, I'm afraid that, no. Yeah, I think it's a similar. It's a bit. It's a bit like sort of if you the, the way I say it, say you've got an oven at two hundred degrees centigrade, and you put a piece of metal in the oven, and now you go out and put that oven in your garden in the snow. The bit of metal in the middle of the oven doesn't get cold. So no, that that's that. That 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 just does that defies all logic and all medical sense. No, they've got some they've got some other discomfort that's and they're blaming it on the coil. Agreed. Yeah, and I, I will say I will say I have uh, some hip pain in my right hip, and occasionally it feels cold, like the 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 nerve feels cold sometimes. You know, so hmm. like we have nerves that sense like pain and you know, and nerves that sense temperature and nerves that sense different things. And so I think, um, I, you know, it's, it's possible to feel, to have a cold sensation because of what your nerves are doing. But if I was to like stick a thermometer inside my leg where the cold was, it would still read 98.6. Absolutely, absolutely right. Yeah. Okay. One, one thing, one thing I will just say though, I think it's very interesting is, and um, I would hate to say that there's no complications ever with coils at all, and they are very rare if they're put in by doctors who respect the anatomy. But obviously, when people are starting, you can put the coils a bit too close to sensitive organs, and we have had patients where the end of the coil so the, the the end bit is irritating something so it's possible that the end of the coil might irritate the vagina or might irritate the bladder or might even irritate a nerve so those things that's much more likely that it could be just the end of a coil irritating and that's one of the reasons why the more experienced doctors get they use the foam sclerotherapy downstream and then they use the coils away from the sensitive bits and you find that when doctors are not very experienced they put the, sometimes put the coils either too far down and get a problem, or the, conversely, they bring them too high up and don't get a result. They, they leave a lot of reflux. So it's a very fine, you know, it, it isn't an easy technique to do. And that's one of the reasons why we're now working on this new invention where we actually can do the same, the, the same thing, but without leaving any coils in at all. And that's is an exciting new idea that we were working on that hopefully will be out in the next year or so. Wow. I can't yes. wait to hear more about that. Is it going to make me wish I didn't have coils? <laughs> no, no. Well, I, I've just actually won an international prize for inventing it. Of course. Um, and so, 
Yeah, well, yeah it's, it's quite quite nice, but they haven't announced it yet because at the moment they, they want to know whether anyone's going to fund it. So they're going through a funding round at the moment and then they announce the prize if they know they're going to go ahead with it. So I'm just hoping because if the if the um, people are interested enough and realise there's a big enough market for it and it gets funded, then it's going to be a, an absolute revolution, especially as it's going to decrease the price for patients if you don't have to leave coils in there. Amazing. Wow. Mm. Amazing. Okay, uh, I'm just going down this list here, and so they're not in any certain order. It would have made sense if I had asked this question earlier when we were talking about the coil materials. Um, so this person says uh, that she has heard that the tungsten in the platinum dominant coil will corrode and cause a slew of health issues. And Facebook group members base this opinion on research that specifically studied coils that were made of 100% tungsten, which could have been found to be problematic, but are completely different than platinum coils. Do you have anything yeah. to say about how different metals corrode inside the body? Yeah, I mean, the FDA, uh, obviously, in the States and the CE over in the HMR, um, what is it over here? We've got the MR, um, MHRA, but, and you've got the FDA. They're, they're very keen on these things. Uh, you've got to remember that although pelvic congestion is suddenly of interest, in fact, coils have been used for 40 years now. I mean, when I was a kid and going through, uh, even before I went to medical school, um, back in the early uh, 1980s and late 1970s, they already realized that you could stop people bleeding from stomach ulcers with these coils. You could, you know, stop certain strokes with them. You could have, uh, you, you could stop boys having testicular problems. Uh, you could have fibroid embolization. So way before we started sticking these into women for pelvic congestion, there was 20 or 30 years of research into which coils are, are optimal. Now, some of those very early coils back in the, you know, in the end of the 60s, when it very first started in the early 70s, yeah, sure, there were, sure, there were, there were some problems with them. But these, by the time you've got to the pelvic congestion, as long as, it, as I say, as long as you go to a reputable place that uses reputable coils, these are way, way, way in the past. These are, you know, these things have been sorted out way before we started using them in pelvic congestion. <laughs> you know, the, the, the great thing with the pelvic congestion for me as a doctor is although it's, oh my God, this is new and everyone's not excited about it. Actually, the understanding about veins, we all knew that back in the, in the 80s, 90s. That's where we did all our research and got into veins. As for embolization, that all research was all done in the 80s and 90s. You know, all of the, the great thing for us is we've brought together the understanding of it, the venous duplex ultrasound technique that we've developed and the embolization, but all those individual things were all invented and we ironed almost all the bugs out of them 20 years before we even thought about pelvic congestion. So it's not like we've just suddenly invented a new drug and does it work or not. We've taken things that are well established using techniques that are well proven to be safe and we just, we just put them together for a disease that hasn't actually been recognized previously medically. So, you know, this is I remember when we, if we go back to removing gallbladders with, with laparoscopic surgery, I mean, we used, to, we used to have one or two deaths of people have bile leaks. And then we went through a whole load of people and ended up in intensive care. And, you know, we had horrendous problems, but now nobody would think twice about having their gallbladder taken out with laparoscopic surgery. In the whole of the history of pelvic congestion syndrome, the number of people who got severely unwell by people doing it properly are you know, absolute handful out of the hundreds of thousands of had it treated. It's, it's been one of the most smooth institutions of a new disease uh, treatment that we've ever had compared to so many others. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, okay, we talked about this a little bit in the, in the last part of the video, the myth that coils should be avoided at all costs because venous compression disorders like May Therner and Nutcracker are the single cause of pelvic congestion syndrome. And I know you address this in your book, but if you could address it again, that yeah. Mather and Nutcracker are not the causes of pelvic congestion all the time, and we don't have to avoid coils. <laughs> No, in fact, that whoever said that has got it almost 180 degrees wrong. In fact, you should almost always avoid stents um, and you should only use coils because the, the thing with coils, and as I say, we do want to get rid of coils. We've got this new invention, hopefully that will do that. But at this moment in time, the only way that you can close that vein successfully in the long term that we know about over a long area, because you can't just close one bit of the vein and hope it works like a plug. 
because the perfectly just like all venous disease is the length of a vein. So the coils close the whole length. And we've shown that they're safe to use in the long term. And because we're destroying a vein, once it's destroyed, we don't have to worry about it. Stenting, on the other hand, as we said, you've got to worry about the stent in the long term. Is it staying open? Is it, and you have to keep checking it. So the, the question is, is, you know, do you have to, do you have to um, stent veins or not? So we, when we looked at our first 5,000 patients that had gone through, because we started presenting right back in the 2000s, when no one else in the world was presenting much at all about this. And we were going to the international conferences and a lot of people were laughing at me and saying, you know, this is a vein conference for lakes, what are you talking about, pelvic veins? And back in 2007, 2008, 2009, I was like standing there and one or two people were just starting to get interested in our work. And we had never had a patient um, who had needed a stent or anything. And uh, we started getting worried because people started using IVUS and saying, oh, but all these people have got uh, narrowings. And when we went back and looked, it turned out one of my colleagues had seen a patient. And then shortly afterwards, I saw a patient who did have uh, a nutcracker syndrome. And we can, you, when you're doing the venogram and you're doing the, you, you do the duplex. In those days, we didn't check for nutcracker. But when we were doing the treatment venogram, if you've got a nutcracker, you can't get the cannula across because it's too narrow. So you can't get the coils in. So, you know, now if, you, if the coils just fall straight in, then the catheter goes, so you've not got a nutcracker by definition. So we went back and looked at all of our patients and said, how many people have got worse because we, we put the coils in and missed the nutcracker? And we couldn't find any. And we, the ones that we'd identified that might be methane or a nutcracker, it's about one or 2% of all the patients who come to see us with pelvic congestion. Now, if somebody comes in and they've got a previous deep vein thrombosis, they've got, you know, scarred veins, of course, that's different. That's, you know, they're much more likely to have a methern in that situation because they've got a long venous history, deep vein thrombosis, scar tissue, leg ulcers, that's different. But someone just coming in with pelvic congestion syndrome, either because it's causing vulval varicose veins, hemorrhoids, leg varicose veins, or discomfort in their abdomen, we can only find significant narrowing of a nutcracker or Maytherner syndrome or the third thing called NIVL, N-I-V-L. We can only find evidence of those in about one or two percent. And when we've treated people with coils, we have we if we were wrong, we would have all these people who had worsened. Now, there's a couple of people who have said that they've worsened and we always invite them back. And of the ones who have come back, We've yet to find anybody who we've missed a nutcracker. We've got one lady in particular who we told, we told her before that we thought she was a nutcracker. She went ahead and had the coils. She has got a nutcracker, but she doesn't want the surgery in any case. And she said, I'm prepared unless it gets worse. So, you know, these are ones or twos that you think. Now, when you think we're doing 10 nutcracker, oh, sorry, 10 pelvic coil uh, embolizations a month, you know, we should be seeing a whole load of problems uh, over the 20 years we've been doing it, if we were wrong. So we've, we've not only got the evidence, and now, as you know, we scan for the nutcracker and everything, but we've also got the long-term follow-ups that we do. And it, it's very, very unlikely that our figures are wrong. Gotcha. Perfect. Um, okay. The next question is that if you have pelvic congestion syndrome, or if you get coils from pelvic congestion syndrome, that you better have a baby before you do that, because you can't get pregnant after. Well, false. that's, a, yeah, absolutely false. They're totally <laughs> false. Um, we're the only people in the world who have published a paper on this. We actually published uh, six of, uh, eight of our pages. We used to, we used to be a bit nervous about people getting pregnant afterwards. But the, the, the physiology is, is once you've actually got that coil in, you, you probably have to be careful for three months. And I would, I would not like somebody to get pregnant for three months because it, until the coils really cause scar tissue, it's possible to dilate the vein. And the worst thing is that the coil would move. Um, and that would be a concern. So what we tell people, don't get pregnant for three months. But in fact, it's, it, it's turned out. So, so we were very nervous. And then we found some of our patients had got pregnant. So we, we, we emailed a whole load of them. And the ones who answered who had, um, we published their results and showed, in fact, they'd gone through pregnancy without any trouble at all. So we published that. So it's well published. Um, we recently had one case, patient where a coil looks like it had slipped a little bit, but even that wasn't a problem in pregnancy. And that was fairly early afterwards. Um, Conversely, we've actually had many people, many women who have found sex too uncomfortable um, and who have had the pelvic congestion syndrome treated 
and then have gone on to have babies very, very easily because they've had the pelvic cancer. So it's actually quite the reverse. We've actually found people who find getting pregnant difficult because of discomfort, pain, and everything else. Um, and once we've treated them, they go back to a normal sex life and actually they, they get pregnant. So we've got a whole host of patients now who actually the reverse, they've got pregnant because they've had the coils of pelvic congestion treated. Um, so, you know, I, I think um, it's again another scare story that is completely incorrect. It's safe to have your, to get pregnant after three months after the cord has been put in. And quite often it seems to be much more comfortable. So therefore people do get pregnant. A personal theory, and I got no proof of this at the moment, but the same way that we know that if you've got venous reflux in your leg, you damage the skin. I can't help but think if you've got pain in your pelvis because of the venous reflux and stasis, it can't be very good for your ovaries. When you put the coils in and you get the blood flow going properly through the ovaries, it can only make it better the same way that leg ulcers disappear on the leg. So again, it's one of those sort of knee-jerk reactions. You're doing something, it must make it worse. Well, doctors do things to try and make you better. And, you know, we reverse the physiology. I can't see why all of those theories would work everywhere else we do venous disease, but suddenly go wrong in the pelvis. It's, you know, it, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. And we actually know uh, someone who came over this summer from California to the Whiteley Clinic. Um, she found you through me. I don't know if you've talked to her recently. Um, I don't want to say her name over here to give away yeah. any personal information, but she was there in July and um, she's now pregnant with twins. So yes. <laughs> did you know about that? <laughs> <laughs> I did, it did. I, I saw it on Instagram and I liked it and we've had a bit of a conversation. Yeah. I'll tell you something else as well. There's, um, there's, a, there's somebody over in the, uh, the UK um, who contacted me, who is a, a critic of mine and his daughter had um, uh, problems uh, uh, with her marriage because her gynecologist wouldn't believe the, um, her, that she was in, in pain in her pelvis. And it was putting strains on their relationship, et cetera. And the gynecologist said, well, she should really see a psychiatrist. There's nothing wrong with her. And he said to me, you know, would you just check her out? Uh, we found she had all four veins, over in right and left, and um, internal ilex, both right and left. We embolized them all, did the whole lot, uh, never heard back from her. And then um, I, I heard back uh, <laughs> a year later, nice young baby, got a new baby. So we may never heard back directly from the patient, but someone who sort of knows them. So you know these happen, but like you said, you know, when you have a problem, everybody's in contact with you. When it's gone, people just forget it ever happened. But I think, you know, in the future, when gynecologists actually realise about this condition, it's going to be up there as one of the major issues for women. And we've just got to get to that point where um, it's, it's diagnosed regularly with reputable um, diagnostic techniques, the patients stop being paranoid about it because, I mean, let's face it, in, in, in the past, so many things you have done, fillings in your you know, hip replacement, so many things sound horrendous, but because you know thousands of people have it, you don't worry about it. Once, once pelvic congestion gets that well recognized, it'll be the same. Yeah, I agree. That's why we're doing this. That's why I keep publishing exactly. stuff. Even though I'm totally recovered, I keep publishing stuff. Um, okay, next question that somebody asked on Instagram is, um, can, can C-section scar tissue contribute to the development of pelvic congestion syndrome? And the simple answer to that is no. Um, so the, cause it's, it's, it's understanding the, um, the layers. So a C-section is only through the skin, subcutaneous fat, the muscle and peritoneum, and down to the over, and it, it, all it can ever do is scar tissue. The pelvic congestion syndrome is the veins that are behind that, they're retroperitoneal, and so, and so there's is nothing to do at all. Now you can get pain, obviously from the scar, from a C-section, and that would be scar pain, and if you happen to have pelvic congestion as well at the same time, you can have two pains, but no, but the two are not linked. Okay. Excellent. I didn't think so. I answered her question. I said, I don't think so, but I'll ask. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, another question is, after you've had coils put in, can you get abdominal massage? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, you can do anything you like after you've got the cause in. But the one thing I've always said, and what we don't know, what we know is when the cores first go in, the vein goes into spasm and it holds them and it's very hard for them to shift, but it's possible I suppose that they could shift, but every minute, every hour that they're in there, they get more and more firmly embedded. And certainly by three months, 
you haven't got a problem at all. Now, if you think about the pressures that a masseuse is going to put on your abdomen compared to you just walking down the road, you know, or, you know, playing sport or running for a bus or, you know, whatever you're going to do, it's absolutely minimal. So I would say, you know, maybe give it a week just because it might make me feel happier. But I, I can't honestly think that there's going to be, if they were that fragile, for goodness sake, you know, we would we would admit people for cause and we wouldn't let them out of hospital for three months and we'd have them on bed rest but they're not nowadays since 2014 they come to the whitey clinic they come in local anesthetic two hours later they're walking home mm -hmm. so yeah no they're, they're, it's not that or not that, that much of a fragile problem you can go straight back to massage really. yeah amazing people always want to know what causes pelvic congestion syndrome yeah it, basically the same as what causes leg varicose veins it's your mum and your dad so basically, because they used to think that pelvic congestion, if, if you want to know instantly whether to read an article on pelvic congestion syndrome or not, if the, peop, if the article starts on and says it happens in women who've had children, put the article down, just don't put it down. Because men get pelvic congestion syndrome, women get pelvic congestion syndrome who've never had uh, veins at all. Men get varicose seals, they get erectile dysfunction. You know, these are pelvic varicose veins that happen in both sides. And you know, this old idea that it just happens in women who've had children is so out of date. Yet I go to, even today, you can go to meetings where so say experts will stand up and say, pelvic congestion, you know, think of it as varicose veins in the pelvis, it only affects women who've got you know, children. And instantly you should switch off because that is out of date. It just comes down to the, most of pelvic congestion syndrome comes down to reflux. It means the valves aren't working properly. They've stopped working. And just the same in the legs, it runs in families very, very, very strongly. And there's very little difference between incidents in males and females. So uh, if my maternal grandmother had crazy varicose veins on her legs um, that she never had treated, I mean, is it? Is it safe to say that maybe she also had pelvic congestion syndrome and didn't know it? Or that are all varicose veins, whether it's legs or pelvis, is it all under the gamut of its genetic? Is there a difference between legs and pelvis? As far as we know at the moment, it's all, it's all if, if you have venous reflux disease, it can happen in your pelvis, it can happen in your legs, it can happen in both. In the same way that you can have veins just in one leg, or you can have veins in just the other leg, or you can have veins in both legs that aren't linked. You can also have veins in your varicose veins in your pelvis, pelvic congestion. You have varicose veins in your pelvis causing leg varicose veins. You have leg varicose veins and pelvic congestion, and the two aren't linked. It just depends which veins and which patterns give way. What we know is the more relatives you have who have got varicose veins and venous disease, the more likely you are to have it as well. And the early results from, as I say, you know, most of our knowledge of incidence of pelvic congestion syndrome is actual prevalence has come from our sort of research where we, we see patients who have leg varicose veins and then how many of those have got them coming from the pelvis. And this is why vein clinics for the legs that don't check for pelvic varicose veins are going to get a higher recurrence rate than those that do because it's all part of one system. Um, what all we know is it's not purely genetic, it is familial, it's there's something else that's going on, it's a host of genes. And the, the figures that are bounded around that I've seen published are something like 16% chance of getting varicose veins in your legs if you have no varicose veins in your family. If one of your parents have varicose veins, it gives you about 45%. If it, if both of them, it's about 90%. But that might just be veins in one leg, veins in both legs, veins in your pelvis. It is, it's difficult. So we just know that some people are more likely to get venous problems because it's in their family than others. There is a very, very interesting um, concept that's come out from a very good Turkish surgeon that suggests, and now I say, why why have so many people got venous disease? You know, if it's all bad, we shouldn't have so many people with it. And his view is, and he published this in Phlebology, is that in a letter, uh, I published a, a research article, he wrote a letter and it wasn't really related, but it's a very interesting concept. And he has done some work showing that if you've got varicose veins, it's likely that you've got slightly larger coronary arteries. So you're likely to have less chance of a heart attack. Now he's not proven it, he's not proven it, but he's put it into the theory with some figures from that he's measured the coronary arteries and people with varicose veins and ones that haven't. And it's, it's a whole lot of his work, he's a very clever man, and a lot of his work is showing that 
if you've got varicose veins, all the other dilating veins and artery diseases are more common as well. And so not all of them are bad, you see. So, so it would start to answer why so many people have venous disease, because there might be a small advantage as far as your heart is concerned. So the, 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 as I say, what, why venous disease is so interesting in the moment is there's so much we don't know about it. We are learning every year, we're getting better at treating it, better at diagnosing and better at understanding it, but there's still a long way to go before we truly understand it. And that's why we can always say yes about things, but it's very dangerous to say definite no's about anything because you might regret it two or three years later. Yeah. <laughs> Treatment for polycongestion syndrome other than embolization. So I guess the most common one that I know about is, or that's not really a treatment, but people try to say it's a treatment is a hysterectomy. That yeah, so, you're diagnosed yeah. with pelvic congestion syndrome. The only way to feel better is to just cut it all out, be done with it. Um, you've written in your book why this is false information. Um, can you share here? Yeah, I, I think this is, so if we're talking about pelvic congestion syndrome being pelvic venous congestion, um, and so we're ignoring other causes that might be misdiagnosed. So, you know, adenomyosis or other causes of pain, which obviously would get better with hysterectomy if it's the, so we're talking about pelvic venous congestion. When you do a hysterectomy, nowadays, most people who do a hysterectomy leave the ovarian veins in because they leave the ovaries in and they leave the internal iliac veins in. So you cause a big trauma that might change the perceptions of pain or anything in the abdomen, but you actually haven't even touched the major problem, which is the veins. So in fact, you've done the wrong thing. Um, if you've done an open hysterectomy and you've removed the ovaries as well and the uh, ovarian veins, you still haven't touched the internal iliac veins because they're tucked right down the bottom and you wouldn't touch those in a hysterectomy because the ureters are very close. It's much safer to do them with embolization because you, know, you can't destroy the ureters. But why do such a massive operation? In any case, we've treated quite a few patients who have had hysterectomies in the past and still have pelvic congestion syndrome and have come to us and have embolized their either ovarian if they're still there, but very often their internal ilia veins. So it's the, the hysterectomy, the, the womb is not really related to the veins. And the only relationship is if you take the womb out with the ovaries and the ovarian veins, then you've got the ovarian veins. But you know the two things aren't really synonymous the, the, the what you have to do is you have to be precise as to what the problem is now if the problem is very mild venous reflux there are some people can get an improvement with progestogens and they can get some so some people treat mild pelvic congestion syndrome with uh, progestogens and uh, uh, the medroxy uh, progesterone and there's some other painkillers again. So there are, there's a medical treatment for mild pelvic congestion. And I always say to people, you know, if you're considering embolization and it's mild and you would prefer to try a hormone re uh, replacement uh, uh, treatment, you know, I've got no problem with people trying. By the time people get to me, they're usually desperate. They've tried other things. It isn't mild at all. It's really quite gross. And with that, You've got cascading blood falling down these great big veins. You've checked that there's no obstruction. You know, the only real treatment is to stop that blood flow going the wrong way. Hysterectomy is just not going to do that um, because most people who have got pelvic congestion syndrome have got involvement of the internal iliac veins. So it's, it's a major operation that doesn't really affect you unless you have one of the very rare people who've got only ovarian vein involvement. Mm -hmm. um, and if that's the case, why not just block off the ovarian vein and not go through the major trauma and the risks of a hysterectomy? Now, if you need a hysterectomy for another reason, that's a different story. But to do a hysterectomy for something as a venous problem is just crazy. It yeah. just it doesn't make sense. You're, you're aiming at the wrong target and hoping you get it collaterally. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I, that's what I've told uh, people on Instagram who've asked that question is um, pelvic congestion syndrome is a vein problem. It's not an organ mm -hmm. problem. And um, that even if you, you know, it's possible to have polycongestion syndrome and endometriosis or yeah. thyroids or ovarian cysts or whatever else, like it, they, they can coexist for sure. And so tools like an MRI or CT scan can be helpful in, in telling you if those things are present or ruling those things out. Um, but like ultimately taking out the organs to treat a vein problem 
is like you said, it's aiming the arrow at the wrong target and hoping that you hit it collaterally. Um, and it just makes me so sad because in the, in the Facebook groups, people have, you know, they've lost the ability to have children because they were 24 years old and they had a total hysterectomy for pelvic congestion syndrome. They still have symptoms of pelvic congestion syndrome and now they have no hope for ever having a child. It's like, that's terrible. I, I, one of my favorite patients, a lovely young lady um, who came to see me and she's, um, she did a little video for us and she's on the Facebook, but um, she, she actually had, um, she was told by a gynecologist uh, that she had such bad pelvic pain, uh, that was pelvic congestion, that she would have to have a hysterectomy, there's nothing else for it, so she must have a children, so she instantly went out and had her three children because she knew she'd have to have a hysterectomy, then of course she found out about us and she, um, we cured her and suddenly, you know, she didn't need to have the children. Now, of course, she loves them and everything else, but she was made to have a major change in her life um, and not necessarily live the life that she would have chosen. She, you know, she obviously doesn't regret having them, had them because she's got them. But on the other hand, her life would have been easier not to have had to have three children in quick succession at very, very young. Um, and at a time that may not have been the best for her personally. I mean, so, so doctors giving advice that, makes people make massive changes especially if you destroy their chance of having children is just i mean I, I, well it's wrong isn't it basically uh yeah and I, I find i find it very sad that people are given i don't mean, i had a patient who just contacted me the other day actually um it's very interesting i had a zoom consultation with her and um she um she's had pelvic pain for some time and because of covid she can't visit us at the moment because she's from a different country and she had actually phoned a um, her uh, gynecologist up and sort of said, "I think this might be pelvic congestion syndrome. Can you just check the uh, check the CT?" And she said, "Oh, you can't. You know, I don't believe in that, etc." She said, "You have to talk to the radiologist." So she talked to the radiologist. The radiologist looked at the CT and said, "Oh no, yes, I can see the veins. You're right. It is pelvic congestion. Of course, the only thing you can have for that is hysterectomy. So you have to go back." And she luckily she'd read my book and she 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 got in contact with us and but that's the still the sorts of information and of course a lot of patients believe if they're told by a consultant they believe what they're told and they don't question it. So I, I consulted with a woman uh, just two days ago and she had been to the gynecologist and he had told her that embolization was not a treatment for pelvic congestion syndrome that just wasn't. <laughs> 20 years, out of, 20 years out of date. Yeah, yeah, right. So, um, yeah, I think between, you know, your book and your Facebook page and my blog and the consults that I'm doing with people to try to put them in touch with you and answer their questions, like, it feels like we're very slowly starting to make progress mm -hmm. as far as dispelling some of this misinformation and these myths and all of this stuff that's just crazy and making people suffer like needlessly, like completely needlessly. Yeah, yeah I, well, I certainly hope so because there are some mad things going on. There, there's um, there's there's one uh, there's one uh, German uh, doctor at the moment who's doing open surgery for pelvic congestion, thinking it's all thinking it's all um, compressions. And I'm very very concerned. And I think that you know when things like that have been done, like us, they should publish their results because I think. It's only by being open and transparent and publishing results that other people can then, can then look and say, actually, you know, should you be doing things like that? And it's, you know, it is very difficult. I mean, there's lots of people who shout and say things on social media. Uh, and I know from personal experience and knowing some of the people involved that not everything that's said is true. I think we all you know, can understand how verbal it is. There's a lot of people who are self self-proclaimed experts what i would always say is go to people who have got peer-reviewed data if patients really have got problems and they really have got uh issues they should be in contact with people like myself and they should be going into talking to doctors who would then publish their case because patients obviously find it hard to publish themselves and if they're very annoyed and they think there's been a problem they should be contacting doctors and the doctors who have he treated them or sometimes second opinion doctors should be publishing that. And that way we would start to see the problems if they exist. All I know is that we've been treating patients since um, for 20 years um, and we've had incredibly few uh, uh, complications. We have had some and we publish them. When we get a patient who says, you know, goes on social media, I write to them and if I find out about them, I say, please do come back and show me where it is. 
And as I say, you know, we've so far not had a single one that's sort of come back that's not been explained. There have been a couple of patients who have had problems, you know, like I've said before, we've had a patient who's had a coil that moved. Um, we actually stopped the program 19 years ago, a patient had a coil that went to the lung. And we completely stopped because we had to, we, we got out. You don't have to have open surgery for that. You, we just put a, a catheter up and pulled the coil back out again. We published it. We told everyone it had happened. Um, and we've published it. So in, since then, we've always made sure that the cores are fitted in and can't happen again. So we address every time. And um, we've had a couple of patients who have had soreness because the ends of the coils were very close to the ureter. And so what we tried to do with those is one of them actually had it pulled out by a gynecologist, um, one with, uh, with, with the urologist to try and remove it. But nowadays we use foam sclerotherapy distally and it goes back a little bit. So, you know, like everything in medicine, there are complications, there are problems. But if a patient has that, the shouting on social media, if it's real, isn't the way to do it. I mean, fine, if you want to do that as well, but make sure it's published make sure it's seen by an expert so that the whole thing can be addressed because very often the patient's perception is not the same as what actually happened and that's only dragged out when you do peer review research and then we can all learn by it the patient will be much happier because we'll be addressing the real problem maybe even be able to cure them but at least we'll be addressing the problem properly and other people won't have to go away just yelling on the social media saying this is all bad all that ends up happening is lots and lots and lots of people who would get a cure are put off and that's the worst thing that can happen of all yeah for sure i couldn't agree with you more i i left all the facebook groups <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I got kicked out of one. I got kicked out of one because I kept sharing your research and uh, and they just kicked me out. But the other ones I left, I just found them to be sources of doom and gloom and very, very depressing and lots of anxiety. And um, I just didn't need that in my life. So I, I'm very glad I went straight to the source. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to say, if, if, if they don't want to publish research, and if you're putting proper research and they check you out because of that, then you know that's not a very good group to be in. <laughs> right. No kidding. <laughs> All right. Well, this has been amazing. I'm going to stop the recording, and then um, you and I can keep chatting afterwards. Sweet. Love you. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you.